Thanks, Eric. Uh, okay, let's talk real quick about Crypto. Uh, first of all, I'm a member of Ruby Core, and what I do there mainly is maintaining the OpenSSL extension. So in Matt's keynote, we all heard about how diversity is the basis for innovation. And I also think that diversity is also what gives us the ability to choose to choose the right tool for the job. And that's why I think that Ruby cryptography should also not be just about using OpenSSL as it is right now. And that's where crypt enters the picture. Because crypt is also about diversity. So in one sentence, um, you can describe Crypt as being a platform and library independent cryptography framework for Ruby. And its ultimate goal is to replace OpenSSL. So that's a bird's eye view of Crypt in general. As you can see, there are different layers. And we're going to look into each layer now in detail. First of all, uh, each of those layers is a separate gem. and um, depending on the platform or library uh, or operating system that you're on, you can combine those as you need it. So let's have a look at the provider layer. Well, provider is a native implementation of, uh, depending if you're on a C-based Ruby, then it's written in C. Otherwise, for JRuby, would be written in Java. And what it mainly does is it uh, will implement all those low-level primitives that you need in crypto, such as digests, ciphers, or signatures, and so on. What happens is that provider defines an interface. In C, this would be a header file. In Java, we have an interface that needs to be implemented uh, by each implementation of such a provider. I want to try to keep those um, minimal so that people would be encouraged to provide their own providers. So it's also possible to do just a partial implementation. For example, if you have one very specific feature that's just um, available in one particular library and you want to use this, then you could write a partial implementation of a provider and still be able to use this with the default provider so anything else would be um, given to you by the default provider, and you can use your special feature in parallel. What I hope uh, to achieve in the future is that to not only support OpenSSL, but to uh, support a lot of different crypto libraries that are specifically um, well suited for different operating systems. So we should support Windows, we should support um, OS X, and so on. So in general, you can think of a uh, provider as writing an adapter for your favorite library. And in a hopefully not too distant future, my plan is to also write something that implements crypto entirely in Ruby. In between all this is the core layer, and you can think of it as the link between the native world and the Ruby world. What it does is it offers a provider API in Ruby. So you can access the provider features in Ruby using such a provider. And there's also some um, performance critical things that have to be implemented in Crypt Core, for example, stuff that's um, very intensive on I.O. And that's why we currently have three different implementations, uh, one for C-based Rubies, one for Java, and also one that's written entirely in Ruby, and whenever I have to reach out to native code, this would be done by using FFI, which is pretty interesting because this allows you to use OpenSSL in JRuby, even if OpenSSL is written in C. And on top of all of this is Crypt itself. You can think of Crypt as the high-level yeah, high level cryptography in general. It's written entirely in Ruby, no more native code. And it implements a lot of those um, fancy acronyms, <laughs> higher level protocols that, yeah, well, use the lower level primitives to achieve some form of protocol. So let's talk about the design principles of Crypt. As you might have noticed, my goal is to use Ruby 
as much as possible. And also, I want to have it run on each Ruby equally well, which is not the case right now with OpenSSL. And by being able to choose, we will also be more independent, so we're not as tightly bound to OpenSSL anymore. And what I also hope to achieve by this is more stability, because right now, we're often surprised by what happens upstream with OpenSSL without really knowing what's going on. So this is always, yeah, kind of sucks because we have to react very fast to some security fixes or anything like that. And if we are in control, um, this would help us to achieve more stability. And it would also probably be a bad thing if the design is nice and everything, but the performance is magnitudes uh, slower than OpenSSL. So I think if we want to replace it, we should be comparable to its performance. This is something uh, that's really important for me um, personally, um, because I think that many of you, if you use crypto, then you're probably not really interested if you're using SHA-256 or SHA-3 or whatever petting scheme you're using. I think the only thing that you're probably interested in is that the whole thing is secure and it should be easy to use. Right now with OpenSSL, you have so many options and it's easy to screw things up. And yeah, it should be easy to integrate a new provider. So whenever you have a new favorite crypto library, then it should be easy to support this. Yeah, I also want to fix some of the problems that currently exist with OpenSSL. Um, it's not like there are none. Our VM users probably know this. If you're on Windows, you probably know this. And the biggest problem that I currently see is the way how OpenSSL handles certificate validation. There's just recently been this uh, paper where somebody analyzed how popular applications deal with certificate validation and it's most of the time it's wrong because just the uh, API is way too complicated. And OpenSSL also, they don't want to implement a proper HTTP implementation, so it's really hard to use CRLs or OCSP. And yeah, my goal is once this is finally done, that we hopefully can kiss very fine on <laughs> goodbye. So I think 10 years of trolling is enough. <laughs> so you might ask, why would you want to break with integrating battle-tested C libraries when basically everybody else who's C-based does this? And <clears throat> sorry, the argument is often that for crypto, you need to be in control, you need to be able to wipe memory, you need to be able to squeeze every bit of performance out of it, so you need C. But that's, I don't think that's really the way to go. I rather believe that crypto in and by itself is hard enough as it is. So if you add pointers and memory management to the mix, this is just asking for trouble because it's just way too complicated. And if you don't believe me, you should look at recent vulnerabilities because I would bet that probably half of them are related to implementation issues and not crypto issues. So I think that we would rather need something that's high level, that takes care of all of this for us, and gives us just enough control to do the things that we want. And of course, this would be Ruby. So I've discussed this uh, with other people on the core team, um, specifically with uh, Hiroshi. And we both agreed that Ruby is probably currently not the best language to implement crypto, because there are some things that are hard to do. But I think we can fix all those problems while we're on the way. And Binyo, which I want to talk about later, would be one of those things that fixes the problems. So now I want to show you some of the things that I implemented in Crypt, which I think are uh, worth investigating. Some interesting things happened there. And the first I want to talk about is the ASIN1 parser that I implemented from scratch. So ASIN1, for those of you who don't know it, you can think of it as XML for crypto. It um, defines data structures in binary format, and it's probably used yeah, almost everywhere. 
in crypto. And because of that, it's also important that this better be fast. One of the problems that we currently have in OpenSSL is that we can't um, process ASIN1 data streaming uh, in a streaming manner. And this is usually fine because the data is coming in little chunks, but as soon as you start, for example, signing a database lock or a web server lock, then you're running into trouble because you can't parse the whole thing into memory anymore. So I looked into other parsers, other parser technologies, and because ASIN1 and XML are so similar, I, yeah, I ended up looking into XML parsers. And if you think about which language has probably done everything with XML in the past, so Java, they have their, their XML parsers better be fast. And yeah, once I looked into their parser technologies, I noticed that many of them were event-based, but I don't really like event-based parsers because all those callbacks, they rip you out of the context and you can't, you don't know what's going on after a time. So I found pull parsers. Pull parsers are mainly, yeah, they look like um, they're non-streaming parsers, but the API is probably um, very similar. And so the principle is that you decide when you want to pull the next token from the stream instead of that your token is being pushed to a callback. And so you're in control when you want to do things, when you want to process your tokens. So the API is pretty simple. You have this uh, next token method that you call in your parser, you get a token on that. And if you want to process this token, you can call IO on it and you would get a stream and can, could process this stream. So it's actually pretty easy to achieve. Um, the next thing that I implemented for ASIN1, which um, I found important is I wanted to have an easy way to create ASIN1 data structures because they're used in a lot of places, so it should be easy to create them. And if you look at this, it looks very familiar if you're familiar with active record and um, similar things. You would define your fields, and yeah, you can declare data, um, data classes there, and as long as you're in Ruby, you can deal with normal Ruby classes, strings, integers, and so on. And only when you serialize this stuff, it will be transferred into the format that is being expected by ASIN1. And currently, if you want to do something that is similar to this, you would have to do this manually. And so you end up writing a lot of boilerplate code, which is probably really error prone because you end up copy pasting so much. And with template, you get all of this for free because this DSL already provides the parsing and serialization methods for you. And all you have to do is declare your classes and you can start parsing and encoding right away. Another uh, specific feature of this parse is that it does lazy parsing. And what I mean by this is that I cache the original encoding once I start parsing data. And there's a good reason for this because Bouncy Castle not too long ago, they adopted what's called indefinite length encodings for signatures. And they had a good reason to do this because this is what um, eventually enables you to process signatures in a streaming fashion. But there's a problem with this because uh, indefinite length encodings, they're no longer unique. They're what's called BER encodings and um, as opposed to DER encodings, which are unique, they are not. And the problem is that if you have such an encoding, you parsed it and you want to re-encode it using OpenSSL or any other library, what happens is they get re-encoded to DER because that's the only thing the parser knows what to do in that uh, situation. And this is really bad because what happened to me in the past is that this potentially breaks signatures and that's something you don't want to have to happen. So the only way we can deal with this is actually to cache the original encoding. And now let's see how this works in practice. Let's consider we have a very simple data structure A that consists of two elements B and C. So if you just parse the data and re-encode it right away again, what happens is it will just cache the entire encoding 
and just dump it out again. That's all that happens. Only if you start accessing the fields, <clears throat> we will start to interpret the inner encodings. And once we, for example, um, imagine we um, access C or B here, then we will interpret B and C's encodings. And now that we got their encodings, we can actually discard the outer encoding because the outer encoding is just, just consists of the encodings of B and C. So once we've done that, we discarded the outer encoding, and if we start uh, writing it out again, we can simply now write out the cached encodings of B and C. And things get really interesting once we start modifying those data structures. Let's imagine we have an A, and now we want to assign a new value to one of the fields. In order to do this, we will first need to interpret the encodings of B and C. Then we can discard the encoding of C because we now assign a new value. And we haven't got an encoding yet. And only if you start encoding this again, then we can compute the new encoding of C on the fly. And in uh, subsequent attempts to encode this, we can just write out the new cached encoding. And that's yeah, pretty much how this works. And once you start caching stuff, you always um, are afraid of how will this work with memory consumption because it can uh, grow quite high. But the cool fact about this here is that we, since we're able to discard outer encodings when we go further inside the data structure, um, it's a fact that at all times we just stay below two times the memory that we would need if we didn't cache anything at all. And so I think this is pretty nice because we know for guaranteed that um, our memory consumption is bounded above. It's also nice that this approach is really lenient. So whenever you write a parser, everybody recommends you to do it as lenient as possible. And um, I've had it happen in the past that I wanted to validate a signature of a certificate but my parser uh, rejected this because there was some date field wrong, and I wasn't really interested in the date field, so I just wanted to validate the signature, and you can do this with this parser. Only the stuff that you're interested in will be validated. And of course, um, all this caching has a huge impact on performance. I did some benchmarks there um, that I want to present to you. So uh, the red stuff is the crypt parser, and the black stuff is the existing OpenSSL implementation. So yeah, I like this one. <laughs> and if you look at JRuby, similar picture. And since this was so fast, I was getting curious and I wanted to know how it would um, stand up to native code. And this is what happened. The only library that was able to keep up with this was um, Java's built-in security library, but all the other libraries that I tested were actually um, magnitude slower. And so that's what I felt like. <laughs> Thanks. So, but I think uh, what's even more important than that is this stuff is so fast is the fact that we have no outliers anymore, like we had for Rubinius in this one slide. So we have similar numbers. Um, Although everything is written in a different language, but because it follows the same design principles, we get um, comparable numbers there, and that's pretty amazing. Okay, so the second thing I want to present to you is Fussbird. The background there is that I wanted script to be really, really well tested. So I think testing should be a priority anyways, but especially for a security um, project. And that's something that I don't see with other crypto libraries. They have some tests, but it's not really, really well tested. So what I do is I have the usual suspects there. I try to include official test vectors in the test. I do code coverage, not only for Ruby, but also for C and Java code. It's on Travis, of course. And for C, I to find memory leaks and all those stuff. I also included Valgrind. But the problem is with testing, um, we cannot test exhaustively. It's an exponential, exponentially hard problem. And to see why, even with the most simple um, methods, for example, if you imagine that this method here 
that ARC could only be take on integer values, we still couldn't test it exhaustively because there are infinitely many integers. So what we need is a heuristic, something that covers a lot of ground while not taking up too much time. And one of those heuristics is random testing or fuzzing as it's also called. So random testing means you generate random data, shoot it at your app and see what happens. And unfortunately, although it's been around for quite a while now, um, people don't really seem to like it. So the arguments are often, yeah, it crashes, but come on, nobody would ever send such data. <laughs> and there's this general feeling of uh, it's not fair because a machine generated it. But I actually think that's the real strength of random testing because it has no bias. So as a developer, you're always biased when writing tests because you think you know where to look for trouble, but you probably omit places that would be interesting too. And that's also what uh, random testing tends to find. It tends to find those weird cases. And that's a good thing because hackers do exactly the same thing. They will use fuzzing to find vulnerabilities in your application. So it's good if you can find them before they do. And yeah, also uh, your users might find um, errors that you never thought of. So just ask my mom, she's found a lot of uh, bugs in Windows that I never <laughs> thought possible. <laughs> and because a lot of this stuff happens in an automated way, we can also cover a lot more ground than we could usually in less time. So in its most simple form, we would just shoot completely random data at the app. And this is probably not what we want um, because it means we're scratching a lot on the surface. So we're wasting a lot of time with data that's, that we already know will be rejected. So we probably don't get the edge cases that are further within the application. So there's a trade-off between completely random data and test cases that apply more structure to the data. And I believe that in order to have a good random testing suite, we need both. And Fussbird is something that um, aims to help you with this. So what it is, it's something that looks probably familiar to our spec. You have this Fuss directive to declare your tests. You have one of those deploy blocks that tells Fussbird how to send the data to your application. So your uh, really flexible there. You, it's not just, um, for example, targeted at web applications. Then you have several of those data blocks that generate the data, and there you have, you're free to choose how much structure you want to apply. For example, this first line, the first data block that's um, producing completely random data, and the others supply more structure. So that's fine as long as you're working with binary protocols, but as soon as you want to fuss, let's say a web app or anything that's string-based data, what you actually want is to have a, some form of template support because you're dealing with strings. And that's also possible with Fussbird. I included this very uh, simplistic templating language. You can see it there in the middle in red. That's a template for producing JSON data, and you can assign variables using dollar and curly paraces, and after that you can assign generators that generate random data to those variables. So what's nice about um, the testing procedure in general is that it runs in a separate process because um, you want to be able to deal with cases when your VM would crash entirely. And so threats were out of the picture. We need to do this in separate processes. Everything happens in memory, so there's no marshalling or unmarshalling. And this, of course, speeds up things a lot. And it's only when something fails that those particular cases will be persisted. Now that we've talked about all of this, uh, the question is, does it actually work? And oh, yes, it does. Um, I can only recommend this course at Udacity. They cover a lot of random testing more than I could do here, and it's pretty interesting. You should check that out. So some of the arguments against random testing are that it's not scientific. There's no scientific foundation to it. But those people tend to forget that there's no scientific foundation for traditional testing either. And 
Another argument is that you need to still need to know what you're doing, but I think you always <laughs> should know what you're doing, otherwise you're screwed anyway. <laughs> and if you really want science, then I can give you some ideas. You could start modeling failure arrival using, for example, an exponential distribution there, and then you start measuring the expected time until one of the tests fails, and you can do dynamically update your tests by doing some hypothesis testing. So if one test takes too much time compared to the average time, you could kick it out and take in a new one. And so you could start off with a basis of just a few tests and mutate them on the way and keep updating them. And yeah, this is the dream of having completely automated tests with just a small basis of tests. So. If there are some R people amongst you, <laughs> please do this. Um, I want to encourage you to play with this. Start fuzzing whatever you like. You, can, you could, for example, start fuzzing the Ruby parser. You could start fuzzing Rails. You can even use this fuzzbird to fuzz um, command line tools. So it's not just Ruby um, only. And I really believe that fuzzing is really the next step of testing, and we should all be doing this. So my next showcase would have been Binyo, but um, I've been working on something lately that I thought would probably be even more interesting since Binyo is just a vaporware right now. So what I want to talk about is hashing. Not this hashing, but um, hashes in Ruby. So let's just uh, think about where are hashes used in your everyday programming. And the question is rather, where aren't they used? I think every real world application uses hashes somewhere. There's been this blog post by Charlie um, about how we should avoid hashes because they're only trouble, but I think we all started to love them and would like to use them in our application. So I don't think we can really get rid of them. Now, what I want to talk about is um, maybe some of you know about this. Last year, there was this HashDOS thing presented at Chaos Computer Club where people um, were able to um, mount a denial of service attack on the hash implementations of programming languages. So the problem was it was quite easy to produce collisions for general purpose hash functions. And what was surprising is that this hasn't been a new uh, thing. It's been around for quite some while. Um, back in 2003, um, Mr. Crosby um, found this, but at the time he only targeted Perl. So that's why basically everybody else seemed to ignore this and it was only fixed for Perl at the time. So, but last year we decided to fix this for good in every other language too. And the fix that was proposed was to randomize the hash function. So why? Because this is something that was already outlined in uh, the book Introduction to Algorithms. They call it universal hashing. And universal hashing means you would just pick a random hash function from a random family of hash functions and this will give you an upper bound to the collision probability. Now, that's all well, but there's a problem with this thinking because universal hashing um, explicitly assumes the hash function to act like a pseudo-random function. Pseudo-random function means that the output is not distinguishable from a real random function. So if there's somebody rolling a die and your pseudo-random function, you shouldn't notice a difference. The problem is that basically every um, general purpose hash function is not pseudo-random. And just randomizing the seed, as we did last year, is not good enough. And to see why, imagine this very stupid hash function that takes in a random seed, but always outputs 42. So this will never be random, regardless how good your seed is. So it turns out that Jean-Philippe Omasson, who's of uh, SHA-3 fame, he invented Blake, and Daniel J. Bernstein, you probably know him too. They were working on a hash function, and by the way, you should follow these guys, they're really good. And while they were working on this hash function, 
they found out how to produce multi-collisions for murmur hash uh, in its versions two and three, and they were even able to produce this with the fix applied last year of randomizing the seeds. And the problem is um, those hash functions are used in C Ruby, J Ruby, and Rubinius in some form, and it doesn't simply doesn't matter whatever the random seed is and how good it is. You can still produce collisions at will. And yeah, I would have loved to show you this, but you all know how it went. But I will probably, yeah, I have some announcement later on about this. So when I heard of this and talked to Jean-Philippe, I was afraid that this would be turning out as a Ruby thing and that people would start claiming, yeah, it's a Ruby problem. So I was looking into who else could be probably target, maybe some language that always claimed to be also secure. And it's uh, used in a lot of enterprise applications. And you guessed right. So good news, they're affected too. <laughs> so OK, we can produce collisions now. But um, what good is that? Well, the problem is that if you think about web servers, what they do is they create hashes from user input. So if you send form encoded data, if you send JSON, whatever, it causes a hash to be filled with this data. And the problem is that the worst case behavior of a hash function for an insertion is linear as opposed to its average time, which is constant. So this means that if you insert n values, you will end up having a quadratic time instead of a linear time. And this is bad, because with very little effort, you can actually take down a web server. Now, what can we do about this? There have been some attempts, and that's also, I think, the philosophy that some of the program programming languages last year took. We could start uh, restricting parameters. We could start looking into libraries each and everywhere. But I think the chance that one of those libraries will be uh, yeah, that somebody will fix this wrong is just too high. So I think we should fix it where it happens, which is in the Ruby function, uh, Ruby hash function. So one way out would be to use a cryptographic hash function. As we all know, MD5 or SHA-1 or whatever, they're just too slow. So what we actually want is to have a really fast cryptographic hash function that renders this attack infeasible. And if you want to know more about how this works, and if you actually want to see the demo, um, Jean-Philippe is going to give a presentation next week in Switzerland, and I'm going to be there, and I will demonstrate those. I will demonstrate how to use this attack on a real-world Rails application. And afterwards, we are also going to publish this code. So Schad code is if you apply Schadenfreude to hash functions. <laughs> and yeah, my final words. Let's make an effort to replace OpenSSL. Thanks for having me here. Sorry for the problems. I want to thank you all. Please visit my code. Please have a look at Crypt. If you can bear it, you can read my blog. And follow me on Twitter. Write me an email. Thanks.